Have you ever had a long distance relationship? Maybe a family member moved away, and so, I mean, you're still related, uh, but now it's long distance. Or, or maybe you met someone while you were traveling or met someone online. Uh, and uh, I, I don't know if you have had that experience. I have. Uh, Pastor Shelley and I met uh, a, a, a couple, uh, but I, I became friends with a guy. We, we were in Mexico, and they live in Argentina. And so we came from each side of the globe, met in the middle. And now for the last seven years, I've had this friend, this long-distance friendship. So in order to, to be able to have a friendship... We have to be intentional. Like, I never see him at the grocery store. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, he lives in Argentina. Uh, and so we have to plan that. We have to plan to be able to talk. And so what we do is we do video chats. And so we, we're able to see each other, and th that helps on the, on the speaking. Each of us is learning each, the other's language. And uh, it, it's so cool, but it does take intentionality. Friendship in general takes intentionality. Have you found that to be true? Like, it doesn't just happen if you don't put any effort out. You, you're not going to feel close to friends. It, it takes intentionality. But if, on the flip side, you invest in three things, time with somebody, conversation, and a shared activity, if you will invest in those three things, you have the potential of a great friendship developing. And each of those is, is kind of a necessary component to be able to have a full, uh, a full intimate relationship, a good friendship. So today I want to specifically drill in a little bit on friendship with God. We, we, we might not think of it that way, a relationship with God, but God is a person. He has a personality. And in, to, in order to have a friendship with God, it takes those three things. Time, conversation, and a shared activity with God. Sometimes we kind of put God in a different box in our mind and think, oh yeah, I pray to him, and we have whatever I, our idea of prayer is, but the best prayer is conversation, where you, not, you don't do all the talking, you don't hog all the airspace <laughs> with your voice, but you actually take some time to listen as well. You talk, you listen. And I'm really excited about praying and fasting because that is a time to really have time to develop that friendship with God. Because one of the, one of the elements of a friendship is time. It does take, it takes some investment of time. Next Sunday, as we've been saying today, we're going to start our annual NFC 21 Days of Prayer and Fasting. I was just trying to add up really quickly how many times we've done it. So our first time in, in, with our church would have been 2011. So how many years is that? This will be our 12th? 11th? 11th. I think this is, uh, 2022 will be our 12th. We're entering it. Yeah, so that's really cool. I, I love that. And we, 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 we keep repeating it because it's so good. It's, it's hard, but it's good. Hashtag worth it. So I just want to invite you. I want to encourage you. I want to urge you. I want to call you to pray and fast with your church for 21 days. However you do it. Like Pastor Shelley said, it really, it, it really doesn't matter how. It just matters that you do it. So one, one meal a day, one meal a week, fast the whole time. We've had friends uh, at NFC that have fasted nothing but juices 21 days. I'm not that intense. <laughs> I haven't quite gotten there yet. But I do about half the time in a Daniel fast and about half the time in just, just liquids. So I, I, I want to feel, that's kind of a goal of mine. I want to feel, I want to be reminded the whole time for 21 days, this is a different season. This is a season for seeking God. This is a season for pressing into his presence. So I, I want to feel it. Like, I don't want to just give up gum, Okay. <laughs> Like, you're not, no, no. What is fasting? Fasting is abstaining from food for a spiritual purpose. Abstaining from food for a spiritual purpose. And we're going we're gonna to talk about that as we go along. By the way, BT Dubs, if you come next week, if you're planning to pray and fast, we want to anoint you with oil. And we'll, we'll give everyone the opportunity to come on up and just be, be anointed with oil for the fast. So we're, I'm excited about that. Would you turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6? 
verses 16 through 18. We're going to get back to that in a minute. And in this passage, in this section of Scripture, Jesus is talking about three things. Giving, praying, and fasting. They are all part of the normal Christian life. So if you, if you are a Christian and you realize you don't do those three things, giving, praying, fasting, you are missing something in your relationship with God because they are a normal part of the Christian life. In, uh, in this passage, Jesus is teaching. It's part of his famous Sermon on the Mount. And he's teaching, and, and he says, when you pray, He's talking to his disciples. He's assuming you pray. He says, when you give, he's assuming that we're going to give. He says, when you fast. Jesus is assuming that we're going to fast. In fact, he, he, in other places, he said to his disciples, and some people came to him and said, hey, other people are fasting. Why are your disciples not fasting? And Jesus said, well, it's because we're together now. This is a time of feasting. But there will be a time when I go, I return to my Father in heaven. Then my disciples will fast, Jesus said. It is a part, it's a normal part of the Christian life. So let's, let's read it in the Bible, the part, uh, verse 16, where Jesus specifically talks about fasting. <clears throat> he says, and when you fast, so he's assuming you're gonna, here's, here's what you gotta keep in mind. Don't make it obvious as the hypocrites do. For they try to look miserable and disheveled so people will admire them for their fasting. So in other words, uh, Jesus was saying, hey, when you fast, don't, don't be like a hypocrite that's just like, I, I want everyone to think I'm really suffering for God. I want everyone to think, wow, you're so holy. Jesus said, do not do that. And he goes on to say, I tell you the truth, that is the only reward they will ever get. People who fast with that attitude of, man, I, I hope everyone notices. Uh, let, let, me just, let me just mention one more time. I, I didn't eat lunch today. I was praying. 32 minutes was awesome. Uh, Jesus says, well, that's your reward. If that's your motive, that's your reward. But he gives us a different direction to go. Thank goodness. Verse 17, Jesus said, but when you fast, Comb your hair. Literally, that phrase means anoint your head. When you fast, anoint your head and wash your face. Then no one will notice that you are fasting except your father who knows what you do in private. And your father who sees everything will reward you. So there's so much in there uh, about fasting. Uh, I love the fact that God rewards those who fast. So why are we fasting at NFC? Why, why are we fasting for 21 days? That's a, it's a big deal. It's a significant chunk of time. It's a significant sacrifice. Why would we do it? Well, our purpose is to seek the presence and power of God. So we're saying, man, it's that important to actually go without food. We want to experience God we want to know God. We want to enjoy God. We want to enjoy his presence. We want to learn to pray. And I'm praying, Lord, this year, teach us to pray. I've been praying for all my life, and I feel like I don't know how to pray. I, I want to know more about prayer. I, I want to know the kind of prayer that touches God's heart. I want to know how to listen in prayer. Why are we praying and fasting? We want God. We want his presence. So we're setting aside our hunger for food in order to focus on our hunger for God, our thirst for God and for his presence. So we're going to invest the time that we would have spent in planning, preparing, shopping for meals, uh, cooking meals, cleaning up meals, eating meals. We're going to invest that time in our relationship with the Lord. So we're sacrificing one thing in order to receive something else, sacrificing that full feeling and that enjoyment of a ribeye steak, hello, somebody. And we're sacrificing that because God, he is better than ribeye steak. Yeah. Now, if you know me, I just gave him one of the highest compliments I could give him. God is better than that. We just had some prime rib for Christmas. God is better than that. Amen? God is better. And if you're not sure, if you're not able to say amen... 
You need to pray and fast. So you can find that out for yourself, that God is that good. And sometimes we just need to take some time, stop the routine, stop the treadmill, stop the madness, and rest in God's presence. Now, uh, when you fast in January, the first month of the year, you are, by extension, you are setting aside this year. You are saying, God, in this year, I'm giving you the first part, the best part, the primo part. And by that, I'm saying, I give you the whole year. It's the same with your tithe. And that's why we give God the first 10%. We don't wait till the end and see, can we afford it? We give God the first 10% because we're saying, God, all of my income belongs to you. And it's the same way with fasting. We're saying this whole year belongs to you. Now, Jesus, in the passage I read in Matthew 6, Jesus said, hey, it's not about show. It's, let's keep it secret just between you and the Father. Well, we're in a group fast. It is a little different in a group fast. It's kind of hard to keep it a secret when all of us are participating at some level, all of us are, are fasting. So, so it, it is a little bit different when, it's, when the church is coming together to pray and fast, but still that principle applies. We fast for God's presence. We don't fast for status or for show. That's, that's not the point of the fast. As Jesus taught us, giving, praying, and fasting lead to intimacy with the Father. What do I mean by that? Well, he said your father is, is with you in secret. He's there. That's what a friend is. A friend is with you in those places that maybe everybody doesn't hear that news or everybody doesn't participate in that activity with you, but a friend does, a close friend does. So the father sees you. He knows that you're doing those things for him. He says, I feel closer to you. You feel closer to him. And the fact of having a secret, that is intimacy. That, that is what uh, fr intimate friends have some secrets. They have some stuff that not everybody knows. Uh, and so Jesus is saying giving, praying, and fasting lead to intimacy with the Father. What is intimacy? It's a close relationship where each person is deeply known by the other. That's intimacy. I, I want, uh, I, I, we know that God knows everything but I want to actually be transparent with God. I don't want to be hiding anything from God. And I want to know God better. How many want to know God better? Anybody? Yes. Yes, we do. And that's why we would pray and fast. You have so many opportunities in this day and age for communication and for relationship in finger quotes. I've had some very interesting online experiences uh, over, these, over this past week uh, with relationships and there's so much room for um for for a miscommunication there's so much uh, room for misunderstanding there's so much room for shallowness in those kind of relationships we have millions it seems like of relationships with social media linkedin even texting there's a little bit of distance in that relationship even with texting and it's possible to even to keep someone at arm's length. It's, it's really interesting. So I want to ask you, in the midst of this day and age where there's, you have so many relationships, how many intimate relationships do you have? Just th think a moment. With how many people would you say you know them deeply and they know you deeply? How about your relationship with God? Is it intimate? Is it formal where you just say, uh, you know, you, you say some routine words or say what you always say and then you just go on about your, your business? Or do you have a relationship that is intimate with God? I hope that you know you can have that. And I hope to make you hungrier for that today. Because God is hungry for relationship with you. And that's the big idea of the Bible. If you boil it down from beginning, literally, to end of the Bible, literally, and all in between, it's the story of God trying to have a relationship, a friendship with you. God wants to be your friend. 
God's idea, his vision, his plan is to have a healthy relationship with you. That's what God wants. In fact, when he, he stated it this way, way back near the beginning, when the, uh, the nation of Israel, God's people, was being formed, he said he wants three things. What's, what does God want? This is, this is what God wants, three things. To dwell with you. God wants to dwell with you. He wants to hang out with you, live with you. God wants to be your God. That's what God wants. And God wants you to be his people. He stated that, Leviticus 26, 12. He just comes right out and says it. And there are actually several other places in the Bible where he says it. So the good news, and this is, this, this is what this message is about today. God is hungry for relationship, for friendship with you. God is hungry for friendship with you. Almighty God, creator of the heaven and the earth, savior of the world, is hungry for friendship with you. Let that sink in. That gives you value. That gives you significance. That gives you meaning. That gives you purpose. That gives you direction in your life. I mean, that literally changes everything. That God is hungry for friendship with you. That's why we pray and fast to take time with our friend, to give him time, to have conversation with him, to have uh, a shared activity with him. And we have already talked today about journaling, and there's just so much, so many practical tips. There's how to fast, when to fast is in here. There's how to journal, how to listen to God, uh, all kinds of stuff, all, all uh, different ways to hear from God, all sorts of tips in there. And fasting and prayer, that this season in our church is a time for us to put those into practice. I want to look back through the Bible, just, just take a really quick, quick tour of the Bible, of some of the ways that God has been pursuing friendship with you. God is pursuing. From the very beginning, the, the first one that I thought of is God came near you, God came near humanity in the garden. God came near. He created a place of beauty. We often think of it as heaven, but I think we got to be clear, that was not heaven. That was earth. There was work to be done. I would not say it was a perfect place. Sometimes we kind of idolize the Garden of Eden. But God said, uh, there, there's some potential here, but we're going to have to get to it. We're going to have to work. And the Bible says that God said, go cultivate that land. Go cultivate that ground. Make it uh, bring forth fruits. I'm going to bless that, but you got to work it. Go be fruitful and multiply. God, God's saying there's something to do here, but God did it with them. God's like, okay, we've got four million animals. we got to have a name for each one by 3 o'clock on Thursday. You know how those deadlines are. And so God got in there, and there, God was a part of it. God was a part of that process. He's working with them. He, and uh, he, he, God did what friends do. He would drop by and see Adam and Eve after work. Hey, how's it going? Let, let's talk. And uh, he, God uh, seemed to love the cool of the day. It says in Genesis 3, 8 to 9, when the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. They knew the sound. It was a familiar sound. And I, I, I don't even, wow, I haven't even studied all the theology on this, but I'm guessing it was probably Jesus that they heard walking there? I don't know. Uh, but they heard, like, physical footsteps. They heard someone in the garden, and it was the Lord coming to be with them, coming to hang out. Hey, we, got, we named, you know, a thousand animals a day. It was a good day, right? High five. Uh, phew, I'm bushed. How about you? Yeah, that was awesome. It was so great. I, I really love that rhinoceros, man. What a nose. So good. I love it. God is hungry for friendship with you. And he, from the very beginning, he worked on that. He came near to us. But Adam and Eve sinned, and they broke their friendship with God. And God sent them away from his presence and away from the Garden of Eden, this, this beautiful, wonderful place. And that, that was the worst punishment of all, is just that feeling of separation from God. Well, centuries went by. God created the nation of Israel to be his kingdom of priests and his holy nation. That's what he said, my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. So God's plan was to raise up a people to help everyone on earth have a relationship with God. He was going to work through Israel. That was his plan. So God then came near in the temple. He created this beautiful building where they could come and worship God. And in Deuteronomy 12, 
5 to 7, God is telling his people, this is what's going to happen when you get into the promised land. You're going to make me make a temple. You must seek the Lord your God at the place of worship he himself will choose, the place where his name will be honored. There, listen to this. There you will bring your burnt offerings. This is God speaking. There you'll bring your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, your sacred offerings, your offerings to fulfill a vow, your voluntary offerings, and your offerings of the firstborn animals of your herds and flocks. Wow. Giving was a part of worship from the very beginning. But listen to this. This is what's so cool, and this is the often overlooked part. Verse 7. There, in the place of worship, you and your families will feast in the presence of the Lord your God. So the people would bring their offerings, and there were certain portions that went here, certain portions that went there, but there was a portion that they sat down and they ate. It was barbecue with God. How awesome is that? We think of the temple as this formal, forbidding place, but what God wanted was to be near and to be with you and to have friendship with you. Uh, again, the people sinned. Again, the people were, uh, God sent them away from his presence from the temple. They eventually came back, rebuilt that temple. And then it seemed like even though they rebuilt the temple, that God's presence was missing. It seemed like God was silent. In fact, between the Old Testament and the New Testament writings, for 400 years where there were no recorded prophetic words from God. It seemed like God was just far away. And all they could do was wish and hope and pray for God's presence. And then God came near in Jesus. That's the third way. So God was there walking with Adam and Eve in the garden face to face in the cool of the day, hanging out, working together. Then God was there in the temple, but you could only really get to God if you traveled there, if you brought the right offerings, fulfilled all the rules and all this stuff. So God was there, but not very accessible. And then God came near in Jesus. And Jesus walked with us. He talked with us. He ate. He ministered. Uh, uh, John, in 1 John 1, said that we saw him with our own eyes and we touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. Talking about Jesus. Jesus came near. He, he walked and he ministered for three years approximately with, with his disciples. Then he died, rose again. And after he rose again, what's the first thing he did? You got any food here? <laughs> Sunday night, Easter night. The, all the disciples hiding in a, in a little room, was scared that they were going to get crucified too. Jesus, boop, comes right in the room. You got any food? Jesus wants to hang out with us. He wants friendship with us. He made him a meal on the beach on another day after he died and rose again. He's concerned about breakfast with the disciples. He's fishing with them. He's calling them to ministry. And, and one of the last things he said before he went back to heaven was in Matthew 28, 20, be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. But he knew there was one, there was one problem. When Jesus took on flesh and bones, he was one man. He couldn't be everywhere at once. He, had, he took on that limitation. And so when he said, I'll be with you always, he came near in a different way. And that's the next way. God came near by his Holy Spirit. And now, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you become a follower of his, he puts his spirit in you, and now Jesus is with you. God is with you everywhere. 24-7, unlimited access. You don't need to travel to a certain building or to a certain place. We come together in this place because we're coming together to worship together, the body of Christ together. But, but in God's word, it says you are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. You don't have to go to the temple. You are the temple. And he said that in a couple different ways. One way he said it is you all are the temple. And there's something that happens when we're all together. We experience God's spirit and his presence. So God came near from in the garden. We pushed him away. God came near in the temple, but it was awkward. It wasn't 24-7. It was sort of a limited access. God came near in Jesus. He walked with us all the time. But then he went back to heaven. He sent his spirit. Now his spirit is with us all the time. But that's not the end of being with God. God is hungry for friendship with you, so hungry that Jesus said, God is going to bring you 
near to him this time in the Father's house. Uh, some, some of the people, we've already sent some people on ahead of us that are already there in the Father's house. But in John 14, 2 to 3, Jesus said, there is more than enough room in my Father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. Now, those words sound sort of holy. I mean, they're written in red. They're in the Bible. But picture a friend of yours that says, man, we love hanging out together so much. My dad's got a huge house. Why don't you come live with us? He's got a pool. He's, he's got a pool table. He's got, he's got pools of gravy. There's just like so many pools there. Uh, in my father's house, like, let's actually live together. Let's hang out 24-7. Are you in? That's what Jesus is saying to us. I want, my father's house is so great. I want you to actually come and live there. And Jesus said, so that you will always be with me where I am. Wow. God wants to be with you. God is hungry for friendship with you. At the end of the Bible, in Roman, uh, Revelation 21, verse 3, we just read this in our last Bible reading plan we just completed. It says this. Someone in heaven shouts out, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them. They will be his people. And God himself will be with them. God gets his wish. We're, we're actually going to be with him. He's going to be our God, and we're going to be his people. And I cannot wait for that day. And you know what? Then we're not going to have to fast and pray for God's presence. Now we do because we're not quite there yet. But then we're going to be with him face to face in the presence of God, and I am hungry for that now. So let's get started by praying and fasting for 21 days starting next Sunday. Amen? Would you stand to your feet? And if you're online uh, participating with us today, why don't you make where you are a place of prayer, and let's pray together right now. Would you bow your heads with me? Let's pray. Lord, I want to thank you so much for always pursuing friendship with us. Lord, it really does blow my mind. It really is amazing that you, who have everything, still want me. You still want us. You still want friendship. You still want relationship with us. And you have worked so hard. I have to work pretty hard to have a friendship with my friend Martine. But you have worked so hard, way harder than that, to be, have friendship with us. You have given time. You have talked with us. You have invited us into a shared activity, your mission. Wow. Lord, you have definitely demonstrated you are hungry for us. Now, I pray, Lord, you would stir up that hunger in us, hunger for and thirst for relationship, for friendship with you. And, Lord, I pray for this next season of time in our church that we would, we would be changed, that we'd be transformed, that not just that I would be a better person, but that my idea of you would be transformed. That our, uh, that our relationship with you would be transformed. That we would come out of the prayer and fasting time, these 21 days, so close to you. That we would be walking along through our day and we'd say, oh, wait, just a second. Okay, Lord, yes. Yes, okay, I'll do that. Thank you. Thank you for mentioning that. Lord, I want that kind of relationship for me and for us. Stir up a hunger. Stir up a thirst in us for you, for your spirit. For your presence, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. And I want to pray about one more thing. I want to invite you into relationship with Jesus. I want to invite you to put your faith and trust in him. To become his apprentice, literally. I want to invite you to become a Christian. Not just someone who formally prays to God. But someone who knows God. Someone who's friends with God. If you've never done that before, here's how to do it. Turn away from your sin. Turn your life over to Jesus and let him lead you. Would you like to do that today? I want to invite you into friendship, into relationship with Jesus. 
if you would, if this is your day, you're making that decision, would you just raise your hand so I can see you? And that will tell me, pray for me, Pastor. And online, would you raise your hand to God and he sees you? I'd love to just coach you in a prayer. And I, don't pray it to me, but repeat after me to God. Would you do this right now? Jesus, I invite you into my life. I know I'm a sinner, so please forgive me of my sin and make me new. I choose to follow you, to be your friend, to be your apprentice, starting now. I give you myself. I give you my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And if you made that decision, we welcome you to the family of God, to the kingdom of God. If you're in the room, would you just check the box at the bottom of the Connect card? You know, give me enough info so I know who's, who's saying it. But check the box at the bottom so that I know you put your faith in Jesus today. And drop it in, in the, the offering box as you go. God bless you so much. Thank you, Pastor Garen. Oh, man. It's just there's some times where we're not sure what God wants, and we have to kind of seek his heart in it. But we know without a shadow of a doubt he wants to be our friend. He wants relationship with us. And so when, we're, when we seek him, we know he's seeking us too. And you, I'm, just, I'm just praying we all go into this fast and prayer with that in mind, just like Pastor Garrett was talking about. We're seeking him, but he's also seeking us. Amen? Amen. All right, just like, just like Pastor Garen said, um, if you filled out that Connect card or if you haven't yet, you still have time. You can just pop it in the offering box at the end. If you're joining us online, hit that subscribe button. It just helps people to find our channel and hear about Jesus. As for all you guys in the room, it's so good to see you and you online. I'm glad to see you too. God bless you. See you next week. Oh, yeah, grab your journals in the back as you go. God bless.